everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Tips and Tricks for Picks and Secure Cath in the Community. My name is Daphne Broadhurst. I'm a clinical nurse specialist with Infusion Excellence Consulting and the past president for the Canadian Vascular Access Association, as well as an adjunct research fellow with the Australian Avatar Research Group. I am honored to be co-speaking today with an expert in the field of home infusion therapy. Michelle Brody is the clinical educator of the Vancouver Community IV program. She's been working in infusion therapy since 2014 and has many years in peripheral IV ins insertion and now sharing her expertise with the community uh, IV program in Vancouver. And I can't wait to hear her tips and tricks that she's learned over the years to help you in caring for your picks with secure cath devices and also how to learn to remove those devices. I'd like to thank CardioMed Supplies for facilitating this presentation. Both speakers are receiving consulting fees for this presentation. Some of the slides have been kindly provided by the manufacturer of SecureCath Interad Medical, as indicated by the SecureCath logo on those particular slides. We are both very excited to see subcutaneous anchored securement systems now coming out into the community system to keep patients' lines secured. Our goal is to help you feel confident and competent when you're caring for a patient with a PIC and secure a cath. I'll start off just by briefly reviewing what the secure a cath is and why you're seeing more devices such as PICs and central venous access devices and drainage catheters being secured with the secure cath. I'll show a few very brief videos to, that depict how the secure cath is placed, how the dressing is changed, and how to remove the device. And then I'm gonna hand the mic over to Michelle and she's going to really delve into those clinical pearls, sharing her breadth of community experience um, to ensure optimal care and removal of PICs with the secure cath. So we know historically in the community, uh, our, most of our picks have been secured by securement devices uh, that are adhesive based, such as the Statlock or the PIC CBC securement system or grip lock, and there are others as well. We see the occasional suture line, although not as often as it's not the, the uh, recommended device, and that tends to be more in lines that are inserted by uh, physician inserters. But we now have a new system that is uh, uh, out in the community to help us anchor our uh, central venous access devices. So the secure cath is the only approved subcutaneous device available globally. It's placed by the vascular access clinicians in the hospital setting at the time that the PIC is being placed. And then the secure cath stays in place for the life of the line. So one securement device for the entire duration that the catheter is in place. Now let's, let's have a quick look at how the line would be inserted so that you have a better understanding of how it works when you do get a patient with a secure cath in place. So here you can see the secure cath and I'm just gonna pause the video just for a moment. So what you see here on the screen, there's two nitinol legs which are laser cut that um, are inserted into the subcutaneous space through the insertion site of the pick. So it's inserted just through the, through the skin. And then there's a, a base that the legs are attached to. And you'll see further the, the other components of the device in just a moment. So once the pick is placed again, the nurse will, or the clinician will insert these nitinol feet through the insertion site. Then they will unfold the device so you can see here there's two nitinol feet and those feet are laser cut. They are rounded edges. There's no sharp edges that are going to cause harm to the patient. So those two feet are spread out in an L shape each side so that the device can't be, be pulled out. The clinician then lays this, the secure cath down on the skin and the pick is placed in that groove in the base of the secure cath. The clinician will then put the lid on top of the secure cath to hold it in place. So that's essentially how the clinician will insert it and how it works. 
why are you now seeing the, the secure cath on your patient's pics? Because the evidence is showing that it is actually quite effective. It is shown to reduce catheter dislodgement rates from up to 20% with our adhesive uh, securement devices down with secure cath to about, in some cases, zero to 1.5%. So that's a significant reduction in catheter dislodgement rates. And because we're not losing those lines, there's also decreased costs related to having to replace dislodged catheters. There was also a study that was very recently published that showed that uh, patients who have PICs with uh, adhesive securement devices had a 288% increased relative risk of catheter-related infection as opposed to secure cath. We may also see reduced phlebitis, thrombosis, and then, like I said, infection in patients who do have these secure cath devices. Now, really relevant to you guys, uh, the data has also shown that secure cath improves efficiency. You guys are so busy moving from one house to the next or moving from one clinic chair to the next to see so many patients that it's terrific to see that the secure cath has actually been shown to save nursing time. In one study, they show that there's a three to a five minute savings in the time that's required to change a pick dressing. The other benefit with this device, and you'll see it in just a moment, is that you can actually lift the pick right up so that you can thoroughly clean the underside of the device and the skin at the exit site. And you, you're not as worried with this device dislodging as you're changing the pick because those subcutaneous feet are just under the skin holding the pick in place. And because you have less adhesives on the skin, there may be a tendency to seeing decreased skin irritation. It is proven by science. There's a lot of peer reviewed posters that we can provide to you if you're interested, as well as journal articles. Um, and also one of the, the articles is actually published by one of our Canadian vascular access clinicians. But as well, what's really supporting the use of these devices in, in patients in both in the hospital and if they're discharged into the home setting with secure cath, it is supported by best practice guidelines. So our recently published Canadian vascular access gu guidelines do recommend the use of subcutaneous securement devices as one of our options to secure our PICs. Overseas in the UK, they, um, the UK did an extensive review of literature and uh, looked at the cost as well related to the secure cath. And they actually have now recommended that secure cath be considered for any pick in the UK with an anticipated dwell of 15 days or more. And they were able to actually demonstrate significant cost savings with the use of the secure cath. And then we also have international guidelines that were recently published that uh, recommended that subcutaneously anchored securement devices, that would be the secure cath because it's the only one on the market, are um, overall effective in reducing the risk of dislodgement. And they appear to be safe in all categories of patients. So that's pediatrics and adults. And they demonstrate cost effectiveness. So all this evidence has led to clinicians now using the secure cath to secure PICs. What is going to be your role in taking care of these patients and their PICs with the secure cath? Here's a video that shows how to change a dressing with secure cath. Remove dressing. So you're gonna remove the dressing low and slow so that you're not causing any trauma to the skin as you're removing it. And you can see the secure if cast blood is in place. Present on the secure cath device, use a sterile saline soaked gauze to dissolve and remove it. Gently lift the catheter and the secure cath. Clean the insertion site and secure cath with cleaning agent. Do not twist or rotate the secure cath during the cleaning process. So that's a really a couple of important points here, but the when you do lift it, you just lift it straight up. You're not bending it. You're not twisting it. And the beauty of this is because you can lift it up, you can clean right up underneath the device and make sure you clean the bottom of the device as well. And just a, another tip, when you're scrubbing the uh, skin, you are using a, a back and forth motion 
up and down and sideways to get all those nooks and crannies and you're using friction. And then of course, you must let that solution dry so that you don't end up with any uh, skin in injuries, which Michelle is going to speak to in just a moment. So lift it straight up and, and clean well under there and then let it dry. Change your gloves before applying the new dressing. So you let the skin dry. Dress the catheter site make per your sure, institute's protocol. Make sure that you don't stretch that dressing though. This dressing looks like it was being stretched a, perhaps a little bit. Uh, if you stretch that dressing, you can cause skin injury. So what you can do is just let it drop loosely over the site, not stretching it and applying it so that it tends not to be stretched when you're applying it. The Secure Cath works with all dressings and or antimicrobial discs. Do not apply the transparent dressing too tightly. Do not turn or twist the Secure Cath from its original position. Be sure to cover the insertion site, the Secure Cath, and any external portion of the catheter up to the extension tubes with the transparent dressing, as this will prevent pulling or kinking of the catheter. There is no need for an adhesive securement device when the Secure Cath is in place. So let's have a look at this picture this is, and try to identify what's wrong with it. One thing I want to point out, you may say that, oh, there's a, a pocket here, uh, the dressing is applied loosely. You do actually want it applied loosely over the secure cath device so that it's not applying pressure as long as the um, outer border all around here is secured well to the skin. So of course, after you apply the dressing, you would firmly press down all over the surface of the, the dressing, except for in this area here, so that you make sure that it is adhered to the, uh, the dressing is adhered to the skin. But note that the catheter here is not under the dressing. You have this portion of the catheter, as well as the suture wing of the catheter is not under the dressing. So while most of the, the, um, the, the secure cath is, it's, chief purpose is to secure the catheter. The dressing does actually have some protective properties as well. So when you're dressing the catheter, make sure that you have the entire portion of the catheter under the dressing. So if you do happen to have a longer segment of the catheter that is exposed, you can kind of curve it so that making sure it's not twisted though, so that it is all underneath the dressing. There are a few tips here on care and maintenance. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna speak to them as Michelle's really gonna delve into some of the tips and tricks, the clinical pearls in caring for these devices. So we're gonna move now to secure a cath removal. Many nurses are removing picks in the safety and comfort of the patient's home or the clinic. If your patient has a pick with a secure cath and you've learned how to remove the pick, you'll also need to learn how to remove the secure cath. And ideally, you'll have hands-on training to perform this procedure. Let's look at how it's done, just through a very quick video again. Remove dressing. So remove the dressing gently. Grip the hold tab on the secure cath with the thumb and finger of one hand to stabilize the device and the securement feet beneath the skin. Pry upward at the edge of the lift tab with the index fingertip of the other hand to release the cover from the base. Place sterile gauze over the insertion site. Remove the catheter. Do not use excessive force. Hold pressure at the insertion site until hemostasis is achieved. There are two methods to removing the secure cath. Let's look at the first method, the fold method that is most common. Apply firm pressure at the insertion site. Fold the wings of the base downward to bring the feet together beneath the skin. Place your index finger on the top ridge of the folded base. Hold the folded base horizontal to the skin surface. Use swift, deliberate upward motion to remove following the shape of the feet. Let's look at that again. You, you use a swift upward motion with a flick of the wrist to pull the secure cath out. The second method is the split or the cut option, which is not usually used unless you're having difficulty with the removal. Grip the hold tab on the secure cath with the thumb and finger of one hand to stabilize the device 
and securement feet beneath the skin. Use a blunt tip scissor to cut the secure cath base completely in half lengthwise along the groove. Apply firm pressure with one hand right at the insertion site. The flexible securement feet are shaped like an L, extending five millimeters to each side of the insertion site. Grasp one half of the cut secure cath base. Keep it horizontal to the skin surface. Turn the cut blue edge upward and use a swift, deliberate upward motion to remove each foot separately following the shape of the foot. Dress the insertion site. There is an algorithm to, to help guide the clinician if they have difficulty. I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into these tips and tricks because Michelle is going to go into the specifics of them. We're happy to share this algorithm with you if you'd like to build it into your, your protocol. There's a wealth of educational tools available to you. If you go to the securecath.com website, they have multiple videos. So they have those two, those videos that you just saw on insertion care and maintenance and removal. They have several information sheets and they have, if you see this on the uh, left side of your screen, they have a smartphone app and clinicians from what I'm hearing are loving this app. It has the procedure for placement, maintenance, removal, helpful tips. So if you're in the home or at the clinic, it may have been a while since you've either changed a dressing with the secure cath or removed the secure cath device, take a moment beforehand to pull out your phone and look on your phone at the secure cath videos and different tools. And again, of course, this, you can go on the website. In addition, they have a wonderful 24 hour support line. You can call them at any time. It is clinical. Uh, experts who will walk you through any difficulties you have. I had a case just recently where a nurse ha had to remove the patient's pick in the home, had never, didn't even know what this device was. And so they called the 24-hour uh, support line and they walked the nurse through and she was able to successfully remove the device. So do keep in mind that there is that support line. They can, you can, if you're in the patient's home at the bedside, they can walk you through right there as well. Or ideally you'll call them just perhaps a little bit before so that you can be prepared. But if you run into any difficulty, do give them a call. As well, CardioMed Supplies is the distributor of SecureCath, so give them a call. They can coordinate in servicing for you and your staff. So now with that, I am so thrilled to hand it over to Michelle so she can share all the practical clinical pearls that she's learned over the years with her experience. Michelle? Thank you, Daphne. I'm really excited to be here today to share our, um, our experience in Vancouver Home IV with this device. Um, so just a little uh, blurb about Vancouver. Uh, we're very lucky. Uh, we've got um, the city of Vancouver uh, has six areas and you can see them on the map here. So each health area uh, is a community health center, has a community health center, and each of which um, of these community health centers actually has an ambulatory clinic uh, within it and groups of nurses that go into people's homes if it's required. And most clients are seen in the clinic. That is the preferred care pathway. And home visits are reserved for clients with mobility challenges or anyone who's in uh, palliative care. So our um, community health services um, are publicly funded. So they're publicly funded uh, through Vancouver Coastal Health. And the acute care sites within Vancouver are primarily operated by either Vancouver Coastal Health or Providence Healthcare. We do have other health authorities within the city of Vancouver, um, but I won't go into those, it's a bit complicated. So our community IV program sees about 260 to 300 individual IV clients a year. Um, and that was between 2017 and 2019, we averaged those numbers. So it's a robust program and we have lots of experience. Uh, with delivering um, IV services uh, in the community. We support clients who have antimicrobial medications. That's sort of our primary um, uh, group of clients. We do have some that have um, long-term IV magnesium replacement therapy. They mostly have uh, implanted ports. We also discontinue chemotherapy that is being delivered via uh, elastomeric device. And we do have some clients who have long-term CVCs uh, such as tunneled lines and IVADs, and we just help them maintain those lines with dressing changes and flushes, et cetera. 
We're also really lucky that um, there's a clinical educator, and that would be me, um, associated for the city of Vancouver. So I am not affiliated with an acute care site. My office and my um, uh, area uh, that I cover is all in the community. Um, there's also another municipality run by Vancouver Coastal Health, Richmond, uh, uh, BC, and they also have an, a dedicated community uh, IV educator. So we're very lucky in that. So all the central lines that we see in community are inserted in acute care. We don't have any community uh, settings where we insert central lines. We primarily see uh, pick lines and um, uh, tunneled lines for our home IV uh, clients that are getting antibiotics. Providence Healthcare has been using Secure Cath for about six years and they use them on every central line that's inserted. Everything from uh, pick lines and tunneled lines to um, non-tunneled central lines that they see in the um, critical care and acute care settings. We don't see those in community, um, but they put the Secure Caths in uh, on every client. And um, so Vancouver Coastal Health also has acute care sites. They are still primarily using an adhesive based device, but they are increasing their use of secure calf. And um, they know that in, in community, we prefer to see them. So if they think that a client is heading uh, for community IV care, uh, they will insert, insert one, but we, we're not at 100% um, adoption rate there. There's no consensus in our region right now about standardizing securement practice, which is unfortunate, but we are trying to move uh, toward that. So we've been seeing the uh, secure cathing community for about six years, and the nurses who've been here that time in that time have really gotten used to it. Um, we do not, if, so even though Vancouver Coastal still uses some um, adhesive-based securement devices, when those clients come into community with their pick lines and these devices, with the first dressing change in community, we remove the, uh, the adhesive-based securement device and just use a securement dressing um, as our primary method of, um, of securement. So we are either using just the dressing or we have a secure cath and using the securement dressing. So clients discharged to community care, as you know, they're generally feeling better than they are in the acute care setting. So they're increasing their activity, they're approaching their usual pattern of life, and reliable securement is key. Some of them are returning to work um, or school, and so they're, uh, they are more mobile, using their arms more if they have a pick line. And um, it's really, they're, they're trying to forget that, you know, they've got this thing attached to them. So um, it's really important that they have reliable securement. And we, in the community, we really enjoy seeing the secure cath. We uh, see it as being a real benefit to the clients and to our own practice and care of the client. Um, it's very easy to care for, as you've seen from the previous videos, and it is very reliable. So as um, Daphne pointed out uh, before, proper cleansing and dressing applications are very, very important. You really need to make sure you're cleaning the device, and that includes the insertion site where the tines meet the skin. So sometimes people are a little bit afraid to get in there and clean around where there may be a little bit of blood from the initial insertion, um, but you really need to get in there and clean. You can lift the secure cath at 90 degrees. And one of the things um, that we have found in community is that you can move it a little bit to the side. Um, you don't wanna move it a lot, maybe one or two millimeters, but you'll see from my next slides why that could be important in some cases. And very important as well, do not stretch the dressing when applying it. I always tell the nurses you wanna float it and that stretching is for yoga. So we really wanna keep that dressing floating down so that it doesn't press too hard um, against the skin. We know that inadequate drying of any cleansing agent um, can uh, contribute to skin injury. And so it's no different with a secure cath. You need to be able to you know, keep the device up off the skin while it's all drying so that there's nothing pooling underneath the device. So here we have a couple of clients that we've had in the community that have had um, some issues with uh, uh, dressings being applied too tightly or um, having some skin injury from not having the um, cleanser drying properly. So on the right, you can see a little bit of an edge uh, to, uh, uh, sorry, around at the base where the edge of the dressing would have been. There's a little bit of redness there and also the big blister, the blood blister off to the side. And you can also see that if you look clear, closely where the Securacath is, that there's actually an impression of this Securacath 
um, on the skin there. So you see how it's moved a little bit away from that position. Um, so we will have moved that over just a tiny bit um, just to give the uh, skin some relief as we are trying to redress and keep the site from getting any worse. And on the left, you can see the very edge of the skin. You can see some um, area, it sort of outlines the shape of the Secura cath where some of the cleansing agent has pooled and hasn't been allowed to dry properly before the uh, dressing was applied. If you come across something like that, we, we try hard not to have other things under the dressing if, uh, if it's not necessary, but definitely in those two cases, um, you just need to deal with some of the injury that you're seeing. So on the right, we are using a silicone-based um, uh, dressing uh, sort of product underneath to try and, uh, and it's got some perforations in there. So it actually allows some breathability and uh, can distribute the weight of the wing and the secure calf away from the skin. On the left, we've used a two by two that can also be, uh, sometimes that's what you have close at hand. One of the things about communities, if you're in someone's home, you can't run down the hallway to the supply room to get that other little dressing that you want. If you don't have it in your bag, you don't have it. So um, sometimes you have to make do with um, what you've got there. So skin injury, uh, so it, you know, the Secura Cath uh, doesn't generally cause problems, but boy, it can sure solve them for you. And um, here is a uh, client who had a severe intolerance of chlorhexidine and adhesive. When you're talking about community, some of the things that you do get are inherited problems. So this had already started in the acute care setting. And then when she came out into community, we discovered that um, it had gotten worse from what was reported to us. So we sort of had to deal with this in the moment. But now if she did not have the secure calf in, we would have to try and find a way of securing this catheter um, while minimizing um, adhesive-based injury by using an adhesive-based securement. So it wouldn't be appropriate in this case. We were lucky we had the secure calf. So we were able to just apply a dry dressing to her. Um, so we put four by fours underneath the secure calf and pick and some sterile 4x4s over as well, wrapped it in cling and had stockinette over that. Um, and we actually left it on for seven days because, uh, and we actually ended up cleaning her with uh, povidone iodine. Uh, so the SIVA guidelines, uh, 2019 guidelines do outline that if there is no pain at the site and no uh, drainage obvious on the outside of the dressing. You can leave it for quite a long time. And we managed um, to uh, stop her injury from getting any worse and it actually healed up a little bit before we removed uh, her pick. So I think it was only another 10 days after this picture that she had her pick in. So we didn't have to try uh, to keep this dressed up for too long. So it can really be uh, very helpful. So the other uh, thing that even though it is a very reliable method of securement, you do still want to measure the external length to track any possible migration that may happen. Um, we do have some clients that are very determined to get their picks out. And if you yank hard enough, you're going to be able to do it. So there is a bit of a learning curve with how to measure. We measure right to the wing, so from the insertion site. And you need to uh, in include the section of the line that is within the device, which is about two centimeters. So we just use um, a wound ruler, uh, which is usually just paper, and we measure. I teach the um, new nurses to measure from the insertion site to the base of the wing so that we can have consistent measurement uh, in the community setting. So it's not just for pick lines. Um, I do not insert secure casts in the community setting, although that is certainly possible if a clinician was trained to do so. Um, this was a client, um, a long-standing client, who had a high output fistula, who was being seen in acute care twice a week for magnesium and fluid replacement. And um, he had this uh, Hickman line in for about 13 months. And I got a phone call from the nurse because we were doing the fistula management and actually changing the dressing on this line. Uh, and she said, Michelle, I can see the cuff. And she said, I can actually see the line move. So I got in my car and um, drove down to uh, this person's house. And his history was also that he was also sensitive to uh, chlorhexidine. So we were using iodine, which you can see on the skin here, the brownish discoloration. He was also very sensitive to the securement dressings that we normally use. So we had to use a different transparent dressing. We tried skin barrier products on this gentleman as well, which is why you can see a bunch of sticky residue. Um, and the other challenge uh, that we faced in this case was that the external length on this Hickman was very, very long. It was about a foot uh, that was coming out of his skin. 
So we, we had a lot, it was like he was on a leash. We had to kind of uh, find ways to um, keep this under control. And also he had um, his personal hygiene and living situation were not very clean. So there were a lot of concerns in this case. And my primary concern was that we needed to secure this line. So thankfully, uh, one of the clinicians at the, one of the uh, acute centers, Providence Healthcare at St. Paul's Hospital, was willing to uh, put a secure cath in for me, um, for this client. So, and they come in a variety of sizes. So this is a 10 French secure cath. Usually you see five or six on a pick line and she was able to um, stop the migration. So this was done within two days of uh, discovering that the line was migrating. We did this in December, and by March, we were able to have an uh, implanted port put in for this gentleman. It was much more appropriate for his condition and his um, personal uh, challenges as well with the um, inability to keep dressing on, really, uh, to have an implanted port instead of a Hickman. Um, and we'd also had a chest X-ray done, um, as when we discovered that it was migrating to make sure that the tip was still in an appropriate position and it was uh, in about mid SVC. So we just needed to preserve this line um, so that there wasn't an interruption in his treatment and that we could keep the line safe uh, and clean. So we were really grateful that uh, we were able to do this. And in fact, as I said uh, earlier, Providence Healthcare, when they insert a tunneled line, they put in a secure cath regardless um, of how long that tunneled line is gonna be in. Um, they, there are some clients who've had them in for many, many years, and they've had that secure cath in for many, many years. Now, removal. Removal of the secure cath. This activity generates the most requests for me um, and uh, the, the support that is required in the community. And um, correct hand position is important, and I'll go over that with some slides. And swift and sure action. So I find that um, the nurses, the challenges that they face with removal is because they're too nice. And you have to be just a tiny bit less nice when you're pulling out this Secura cap. For some clients, it can really stick. Videos that you saw, you can see that they come up mostly very easily. But every once in a while, you've got one that's really just stuck in there. You're in someone's home, you got to get it out. There's only one way to get it out, and that's to pull harder. So I'm going to go over um, some tips and tricks on how to achieve that. So a hand position is important, and when you are folding um, the Secura cap in half, I have had some nurses, they get that grip underneath. So they're holding the tabs um, on the left. You can see um, where I've got my hand position. It's just holding the tabs um, that fold under, um, and that is not going to get you uh, a good grip on the device because you're going to, as you lift, it's going to just cantilever, and you're going to not be able to get that device out. So on the right, you can see your hands are over the device. And in fact, the, uh, you can have your finger right on that blue part there to really give yourself a good grip and to pull it out in a swift motion. The other thing you need to make sure is that the base is totally folded so that the feet are together. You can feel like you have folded it well, um, but as you see from this picture, if you don't have it 100% folded, you're going to have the tines uh, moved out a little bit and that will make it harder to remove. Um, the device is small and when people are first learning how to remove it, they can be a little bit shy about getting a good grip on that device. And so then what happens is they don't squeeze it together properly and that you can see that the device will keep that little, their little feet out and that will make it harder to remove. I got a call a, uh, just last week actually about uh, uh, from a nurse saying, I can't get this thing out. She had tried the folding technique and also splitting it. So she'd removed the pick line. She cleansed the area. She covered, with it, uh, covered it with a transparent dressing and we went together the next day for me to remove this uh, secure calf. And um, because it was already split, I didn't need to cut it. I, clean I removed the transparent dressing. I cleansed it again. I've got sterile gloves on and now I'm gonna remove. And you'll see the hand motion that's required in order to really get out a bit of one that could be a little more stubborn. So I've just tr putting some traction on the skin so that I'm not working against too much. And there, it's very much a flick of the wrist where you've really got to be swift and sure because the longer, if you're too gentle, you are going to be pulling on it far longer than you need to. And that is actually what's going to make it uncomfortable for the client. If you're doing it nice and quickly, you're going to be able to get it out faster. If it's really, um, a, you know, a bit more determined to stay in there, they may, you know, they will feel a pinch, but it's brief and it's momentary. And once it out, 
it's out, then that pain is gone or that discomfort is gone and, um, and they're fine. So the longer you're trying to be nice, sometimes that's what um, actually causes the discomfort more for the client. So um, I will talk about once you've split it, um, another way of getting the, uh, the tines out. Um, I will say that in, in our community, we primarily go with the fold method first. So we don't split um, the, cath the secure cath unless we are having um, some difficulty with the fold method. And I would say most of the time it goes smoothly with the fold method. And again, even with that method, you just need to have that quick quick and sure um, hand motion to pull that line out. And um, once nurses get the hang of that, we hardly ever have to split them. However, if we do have to split them, um, sometimes on ones that are really stubborn, I have found it, it a little bit easier, instead of moving, uh, twisting the blue to the sky, even with the split method and pulling up, on the ones that are particularly stubborn, I have a side motion where I just pull it out sideways following the track of the tine under the skin. So if we um, run this video, um, you'll sort of see in slow motion what I'm talking about. So instead of, so you're pulling it out sideways. And for ones that are particularly stubborn, and for the gentleman in the previous um, video, that is the method that I used. So you wouldn't pull up if you're not having the blue to the sky, you wouldn't pull up because that wouldn't put the tine in the correct position. You would pull sideways. And again, it's a swift motion to try and get that tine out quickly. So with any program, when you are um, uh, introducing a new product, and um, Daphne talked about the situation where the nurse showed up in the home and had never even seen a secure cap before. So when, you're, uh, when they're introducing this into the acute care area and, um, and learning how to uh, use them and insert them when they're inserting the central lines, you can have a few growing pains. So one of the growing pains is when the device isn't anchored properly, um, the lid isn't put on properly. So we have a picture here where it isn't quite snapped together. So uh, the problem would be that the line is actually not secure. Um, so if you have some comfort, you can go ahead and, and make sure that it's secure and snap that lid on there. Um, I will say though that what you wanna make sure is that the, the pick line is within that blue cone track. Um, we have had a few situations, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures, where the lid has been snapped onto the base, but the pick wasn't in that track. So it was being pinched inappropriately in the secure cap. And that was just, again, growing pains, a new operator learning how to use the secure cap. So sometimes you will feel that it's not flushing properly, you can't get blood back, and, um, and it's because the secure cap hasn't been closed properly. But once the operators in the acute care sites have become proficient and they're used to it, we don't see these problems really anymore unless it's a physician, a resident physician, um, for the occasional client that has to have this inserted in the um, radiology department. The other growing pains is if a nurse uh, or someone doesn't know what it is and doesn't understand that it's actually securing the line. So we have had, um, this line is super duper secure because it has a securement adhesive based securement device and the secure cap. This pick line is not going anywhere and it's got a securement dressing on top of that. So this line is safe, but it just doesn't need to be quite that safe. Um, and again, we're using the secure cap to uh, reduce the um, uh, the need for securement uh, DESA based devices. And so if you're seeing this, then sometimes we need to have some additional education for your staff or for um, the staff in the acute care centers if they're not understanding um, what the, the secure cap is. And, and we have found one of the reasons that we moved away from securement adhesive based devices also is when you're removing them and reapplying them, you're manipulating close to the pick line and the, the, the chances of migrating just by trying to put on that adhesive based securement device is it increases the risk of migration of the line. With the secure cath, you don't ever have to take it apart. It just stays there for the life of the line. And um, so in that in itself, other than being a good securement device, also you, it reduces the amount that you need to manipulate the line, which could contribute to migration. So sometimes you just need to um, have another round of education for your staff if they are not used to seeing um, this device and knowing what it is. 
So um, really in summary, this is a very safe and reliable securement device in our community setting. We really love it. We would like to see it used as a matter of uh, standard practice in, in the community. You just get what everybody gives you. So you can try and influence practice as much as possible. Um, you can have post um, central line uh, insertion application of the device as we saw with that uh, tunneled line. And really most challenges can be mitigated with education and experience of so even the difficult removals. Um, once people have done it a few times, um, really the calls for help are, are much reduced. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you so very much, Michelle. Just a couple of uh, points that I'm going to just run over as some of the key points if, when you are caring for a patient who has a secure cath, based on what we've learned from uh, Michelle, as well as from some of the key principles in caring for the secure cath. So when you're doing the dressing change, be sure to lift the secure cath and pick. You lift it up as a hinge and clean all the way around. And as Michelle said, right into the tines or the legs, right where they enter the skin, make sure you clean there as as well, but make sure you're not twisting the device uh, because that's going to cause probably some pain to the patient. When the antiseptic solution is dry, then you can let that secure cath fall down into its natural place and then just shifting it slightly so that you don't end up with those pressure uh, injuries that Michelle showed you earlier. Never stretch that dressing. I love Michelle when you said just let it float down so you're not applying it, stretching it down. You just let it float down into place and then you press it down to secure it into place. As far as removal, make sure that you fold those feet together fully so that the feet go down and are joined together and not separated a little bit like we saw Michelle uh, showing in her film. Uh, you can, of course, as well, apply pressure to the skin just adjacent to the site. If there is any debris, dried debris at the site, clean it with saline, squirt it with a little bit of saline from your syringe or soak a saline um, gauze and leave it on the skin a few minutes before. And then as Michelle said, be swift and purposeful in that lifting of the device. The, here are some of the references that were used for this presentation. If you go to securecath.com, they do have all kinds of um, evidence posters, uh, published manuscripts as well that are available, and we're happy to share those with you too. Yeah. I really want to thank you, Michelle, for sharing all these clinical pearls to help clinicians feel confident and, and to be confident competent in caring for community patients with their PICs secured with secure cath. It's, um, it's been great to learn those tips and tricks that you've actually learned in the real world to make sure that they are super duper secure with just <laughs> a, a dressing and a secure cath. And with those tips and tricks, we hope that you have lots of success in caring for these devices. If you have any questions, uh, I'm going to leave my email on the, the next slide and the 24-hour support line that you can call at any time if you have any questions to, for the Secure Cath uh, experts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Daphne. And now we'll open the floor to any questions. I, I do have a, a couple of questions that I've received. If a patient is complaining of pain while the Secure Cath is in place, not a on removal, but just during dwell, what would be some steps that the clinician could investigate to try and alleviate that pain? Sure. So one of the things we do find is um, that sometimes right after insertion, after the uh, freezing wears off, they can have pain for one or two days or just a bit of pinching and discomfort at the site. And in the acute care settings, they usually just give plain Tylenol to get that to um, to dissipate for the pain to go away. And it seems to be that after one or two days, that seems to settle down. There are occasionally people, and I, I think a, a question came up about clients who have cancer. Um, we, we do see it in clients who are getting chemotherapy. And sometimes, you know, if they've lost some weight or they don't have a lot of subcutaneous tissue, the tines can, it, there's not a lot of tissue right where the insertion site is. So it may feel a little pokey to them. What we sometimes do is just take uh, two by two and just lift, like just put it under the secure cath to just 
put the tines down or the feet down. I keep calling them tines, but they're kind of feet uh, down a little bit. And sometimes that makes it more comfortable for them. Um, but in general, we find it to be very well tolerated. Of course, you just don't want to be doing, you know, you can lift it up and down, but you just don't want to be swinging it around very much. Um, that, you know, clients can say that it gets a little owie then. And, but people will usually get used to the feeling under their skin. I was just in a, excuse me, in a cancer center doing some in-servicing this past week. And they had a patient come in who had been complaining of pain since the previous day. And what the nurse discovered, she had just been at the in-servicing the day before, fortunately. The nurse, the previous nurse, there was a little bit of bleeding. So they had applied um, kind of a, a compressive dressing on the secure calf. And so then what happens this is just my jumbotron version. So we should have the feet um, in fairly deep down in the subcutaneous tissue. But if the sub secure calf is pressed down, if that dressing is too tight, what it does is it pushes the feet up. If you can see it, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but it pushes the feet up against the skin much more superficially rather than in the deep subcutaneous tissue. So that will cause some pain. And as soon as that nurse removed that dressing, the patient said, oh my goodness, I have no pain. And then there was a second patient the same day. And to your point, Michelle, um, the nurse noticed right away when she took the dressing off. We know that, as you said, the secure cap is supposed to just lay flat in its natural position. But she saw as soon as she took the dressing off, that the secure cath was pushed over to the side. And so if you push it to the side, that can twist the feet. So we always have to make sure that when we're applying it, we just drop it straight down. And again, as soon as that nurse had lifted the device and then just let it fall into place, that patient said, oh, there's no pain anymore. There's a question about when cutting the secure cath, do we need to use sterile scissors or regular clean surgical scissors? And we always use sterile scissors. So what you'd have to do is take off your sterile gloves, open a sterile set of scissors and add them to your uh, tray and then uh, clean your hands again and put on your new set of sterile gloves in order to cut the line. One of the things that's really important is if you're going to cut that secure calf, take the pick out first. In our community, we usually end up taking, well, it's kind of 50-50. You can either take the pick out first and then the secure calf or the secure calf out first and then the pick. Um, but in, um, if you're in an acute care site and you're, you're using them for jugular lines or so, you're going to want to take the secure calf out first. Uh, but yes, you need to use sterile scissors. Just don't cut the pick because that's a whole different set of problems if you're going to go ahead and do that. And do know that if when you are cutting it, you're actually cutting through some plastic and you're going to have to use a little bit of force mm -hmm. as you cut through that groove. It's not an easy cut. It, it's, it's meant to be a, a strong device. So it, it, it does take a little bit of um, force to actually cut through the device. Sharper scissors, although if they're the, the medical grade ones so that you're not going to nick your patient, uh, work well for that. We have a couple of other questions. Do we have any hospitals in Southwest Ontario beginning to put these in? And uh, Raphael, I don't know if you're on the line. I do know that Southlake uh, and just north of Toronto is placing these devices. Um, in terms of the uh, Southwestern Ontario, it's more to the north, uh, Sioux, Thunder Bay. Uh, we've got some in the Toronto area currently and um, Presently, it's just being under review at a few of the hospitals in uh, London. And I think also there's a team that's placing some secure cath in the Ottawa region for those in a complex care unit, I believe. Yes, and, uh, and Ottawa. There's another question here. Um, how would we use the secure cath with 3M PIC CDC securement dressings used by both CELHIN and CLHIN? Those are two community uh, um, regions in Ontario. So the, the 3M PIC CBC securement uh, dressing is a securement device. It's an adhesive based securement dressing. So it really would be overkill using both the 3M um, PIC CBC securement dressing as well as a secure cath and very costly to the healthcare system. So if the secure cath is in place, then, and I know uh, in both of those two LINs, they do have just the, the uh, traditional transparent film dressings uh, that are not securement dressings. They would use those dressings on top of the secure cap. And, and we use the um, IV 
Tegaderm IV Advanced for our standard dressing, which is a securement dressing. We still use it so that we're not switching in between products. The only reason we would not use that is if um, there was a, a you know, a sensitivity to that dressing. Um, but I know that the PIC CVC, it does come with an adhesive based securement device. You just don't need it because the, you know, you can switch to some other type of securement dressing or discard that out of your dressing pack. By the way, you wouldn't need both. I have another question for you and I'm going to try to just show it quickly here and just putting together a demo board. So Michelle, if you did ad uh, address this in one of your your slides, when you have a longer external length, and now this is just a demo board, of course, but when you have a longer external length, do you curve the pip, the pick like this, where you're, you're bending the secure cath, or where would you bend the catheter so that you have both the secure cath and the suture wing under the dressing? You wouldn't want to bend it at the insertion site. So if it was, now this one doesn't have the longer external length, but just, you know, if we sort of pretend, it, you, would, you would want to give a curve um, well after where the, the, where the pick line comes out of the secure cath because you don't want it to kink. What you don't want is this because then you're kinking the line. Whoops, that's not really okay. So like you don't want it kinking like that. You would have it more that it was looped now this, like I said, this one's too short, but you would wait for the loop to come out after. And you might need to use just a slightly larger uh, dressing. Often the, the securement dressings or any dressing will come in a slightly larger size as long as you've got the insertion site in the wing under the dressing um, to cover the whole line. Perfect, thank you. Um, what, what can be used for cleaning if the client has an um, allergy or sensitivity to chlorhexidine. I know in our region, we would go to the chlorhexidine without alcohol. And then you had mentioned what your, the solution is that you use. So we are first line after, um, so it sort of depends. Some clients you can use chlorhexidine without alcohol. Um, our standard is to go, the initial uh, one that we use is chlorhexidine with alcohol then we would go to povidone iodine actually. Um, and uh, unless the client has said in the past, you know, if this isn't the first time they've had a central line that has had uh, cleansing issues, they might tell us that they use um, the chlorhexidine without alcohol, then we would use that. But generally we go straight to povidone iodine if they're having problems with uh, our standard cleansing agent. And then if you find that the patient is still reacting to the povidone, have you ever moved to sterile saline, which we know has no antimicrobial properties, but can help clean the site? Um, we, we would really only go to sterile uh, saline if this, there were open sores that were really weeping and it was very angry looking site. Um, we've had some that, um, uh, that require that, but we very rarely use it. We've had the occasional client where we can only use um, alcohol swabs to clean the skin. And then again, we just keep a really close eye on their site to make sure um, that they don't have any infection brewing or anything like that. It's definitely not our preference. Um, we might try changing the dressing product or just going to a non-adhesive dressing at all, like, uh, like sterile four by fours, cling wrap and stockinette. Um, that would be in an extreme case. I've also used um, silicone dressing um, but the one that I had to use on one client, it's actually, you can't see the site. It's not transparent at all. Um, so we just kept an eye on her, uh, you know, any pain at the site, any uh, dressing, uh, sorry, oozing or anything that was showing any drainage through the dressing. And if she was showing any signs of line infection, fever, increased white count, anything like that. So we didn't have to, you know, she was fine. Um, and you do want to keep a transparent dressing on there if you can, but sometimes you can't. You've got the occasional client that's just so sensitive um, that they had to, do you have to move to something else? So that answers the question, the next question, which was in case of a skin reaction, would we be able to use a duoderm dressing to protect the skin in the community? So you can use a hydrocolloid underneath if um, to, to protect the skin. Uh, and as Michelle said, uh, your practice, you do not change, because normally we know that 
um, previously, if there was a, an opaque dressing, that we would change that every four, 48 hours. But now with the new CIVA guidelines, as you mentioned, as long as you can still do an assessment to rule out infection, then you don't change that dressing do you, uh, every two days. Do you wait um, if, there, if your assessment indicates no further complications? Do you change it once a week or how often would you change that? Once a week is ideal. Uh, it really depends. Some of those dressings, they don't stay very secure on the client, just depending on their level of activity. Um, but we have had clients where that dressing can stay in place for seven days and it's been okay. So as long as the insertion site and the line and everything is covered, there's no drainage on the outside, the client isn't showing signs and symptoms of any kind of infection, and that there's no pain at the site with gentle palpation, we do try to leave that in place because otherwise you're just ripping that dressing off, ripping off the skin that you're trying to heal underneath. Super, thank you. And I think that concludes our questions. So Michelle, again, a, a huge thank you for sharing your knowledge and your uh, expertise, all the, the experience you've gleaned over the years. Uh, I'd also like to thank CardioMed for sponsoring this event. And again, guys, you know, if you do have Secure Cath and you're, you haven't received the training, CardioMed, they can provide training. But honestly, the I had a, a nurse in the community she didn't know what this, is, this secure cath was, had to remove the pick. She called the 1-800 number. It is vascular access, or it is nurses who are familiar with secure cath. That's what they do. You're not gonna be put on hold. It's six nurses who carry the same number. They'll answer the line and respond to your question immediately. They were able to direct the nurse in the home to walk through that procedure. So do use that 1-800-225-0000 as a resource, as well as the amazing uh, app for your smartphones and securecath.com that has those two minute videos that I just showed you. And can I just put a plug in for, you know, you can get these little kits um, that allow, they have a pick in place and it allows you to practice. Um, so what I do when I've got nurses who are inexperienced or just need a little refresher and they're asking for support because I can provide elbow to elbow support, um, I just take this with me. We practice before we see the client and then um, they have a little more confidence when they go in to do it with the person. So if that's possible, sometimes that's a good way to go just so that you have some practice. Yeah. Certainly, I know CardioMed, when they provide in-servicing, they do provide um, the demo boards to the educators of the organizations so that you can sustain that education and kind of train the trainer and make sure that the clinician is, is uh, competent with the procedure before they do um, either dress or remove the device. So with that, thank you everybody for sharing your day with us. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much.